Are we ready once again to be a bold, dynamic people, ambitious and confident, ready to take on new challenges and new horizons the way our ancestors did? Unfortunately, we've been under terrible guilt trips for ambition from both ends of the political spectrum. But this is still part of our spirit. And now we have planetary resources announced by my friend Peter Diamandis and his partners, Larry Page and Eric Schmidt of Google, and uh, the great film director James Cameron, who crushed my film, The Postman, and Chris Luecki and Tom Jones and other students of John Lewis, the originator of this idea of going forth and, according to the title of his own book, Mining the Sky. Because that's what Planetary Resources is about. Going out there and finding the trillions of dollars of resources, possibly as much as quadrillions, that is inherently available in asteroids and other small bodies in the solar system. Now it's an old dream. I actually pursued it for a while uh, in my 30s after I got my PhD studying uh, comets and how many of the comets might become asteroids by choking off under dust layers. Peter and his pals may find that to be the case when they get out there. I worked for the, my wonderful professor, uh, James Arnold, the late James Arnold, at the California Space Institute, where we studied with John Lewis some of these possibilities and tried to persuade NASA to move in these directions to no avail. The space shuttle era was upon us and the stagnation that resulted. But planetary resources is talking about changing all that. Is it possible to change all that? Let me give you a little metaphor about what the space race felt like. All the way until the early 70s, it seemed as if humanity was developing greater and greater ability to go fast, speed along a logarithmic curve that started very, very slow back in the era of feet and then horses, carts, and then horseback riding, and finally getting into boats, steamboats, and then the railroad, automobile, airplane, rockets, all the way up into the skyrocketing speed increase that enabled us to send pioneers 10 and 11 and voyagers 1 and 2 to escape velocity where they would leave the solar system. It seemed by extrapolating this curve that it would be endless, that within one human lifetime we would be challenging the stars, the vast gulf between solar systems. The thing about logarithmic curves or exponential curves is they're really, really cool models until suddenly one day they stop. People who follow such curves often feed asset bubbles like the housing crisis or gold. And they always find that inevitably there's something called the S-curve. What a tragedy. Things that you thought would extrapolate exponentially forever taper off and become a plateau. And ever since 1975 or so, we've had this sinking feeling that space has turned out to be a lot harder than we thought. Well, it was. Apollo seemed deceptively easy, but when you really think about it, Apollo was divine madness. We accomplished something that we simply did not have the technology to do. Uh, you have more computational power in your iPhone than all of NASA had in those days. All of it. No, what the Apollo program was, was evidence that human beings can overcome almost any obstacle if they throw at it enough money, water, and desire. After all, look at Las Vegas. The thing about these plateaus, though, 
is that, especially with the disappointing effects of the space shuttle and the space station, and distractions like the recent call to go back to the sterile and useless moon, we got used to this plateau. And kids nowadays, like my own kids, are disenchanted with space. And here's the irony. You get so used to plateaus that you get used to thinking of them as the model of the world. And that's just as inaccurate as the endless logarithmic or exponential curve. Just like those curves end, plateaus end. And we may be about ready to start a new climb in space. With that little riff, that little aside, Let's get back to planetary resources, because it's very exciting. They want to take advantage of the fact that I talked about earlier. As an advisor to NASA's Innovative and Advanced Concepts, NIAC program, I've been privy to some of the exciting new cutting-edge or even pre-cutting-edge technologies that are on the horizon. It seems that the computational power, the materials, the ability to detach small satellites from major commercial launches, the advances in commercial launch that are being pushed forward by Elon Musk and uh, SpaceX and some of the other good billionaires out there who are trying to move ahead in launch capabilities. These all seem to be coming together. And so planetary resources is seeking to exploit all these that are coming together at once. Their first step is to develop what's called the ARCID spacecraft. The ARCID 100 will orbit the Earth and in little clusters of very inexpensive satellites, down around the tens of millions of dollars, use the new techniques to pipe back home vast amounts of information gleaned by new kinds of optics to find and characterize the valuable small asteroids that might be in near-Earth passing orbits. Some of these near-Earth passing asteroids are easier to get to dynamically than the surface of the Moon. Take a little longer, we'd mostly use robots, but there might be a role for humans in the process as well. Interestingly, they're talking about going after some that are in the hundreds of meters across. Because that sounds less threatening than looking at one that might be a kilometer across. Then people start thinking about dinosaurs. In any event, what are they going after with this ARCID 100 to find and characterize all of these? And they may use group sourcing for the computation. You yourself might devote part of your computational hours for your, when your computer clock is not operating at full speed to grinding numbers for planetary resources. Might they decide to give you a share of stock in return? That would be fair. It's just a suggestion. The ARCID 200s will be a more advanced series that will characterize these objects a little more closely and start zeroing in on ones to explore. The ARCID 300s will actually go, focus in, find out what they're actually made of. Now we know a lot about what they're actually made of because these are the sources of meteorites. And we know about lots of different kinds of meteorites. One that just exploded over the Sierra Nevada here in California was a carbonaceous chondrite, very rare. These are materials that contain a lot of volatiles. And if we found one of those in near-Earth orbit and could park it near, but not too near the Earth, one of the ideas is to surround it with a big plastic bag mirrored on one side and let sunlight cause the volatiles within, especially if it's an extinct comet, my doctoral thesis, to cause the volatiles within, especially water, to evaporate out to be collected and then use a secondary solar process to divide that, some of that water into hydrogen and oxygen. What have you got then? Rocket fuel, very good rocket fuel. And the leftover water, need that for life support. 
it turns out it costs tens of thousands of dollars per kilogram to launch water from the Earth to the space station or for other uses in space. If we could get this, these volatiles cheaply for rocket fuel and life support from carbonaceous chondrites, from just bagging them, that would pay for the entire enterprise. But then you get to the real riches, metallic asteroids. If you were to take, um, John Lewis calculated this back in the 80s in his wonderful book, Mining the Sky, be sure and get it. If you were to take one, one kilometer across metallic asteroid and melt it down using advanced solar mirrors that we don't know quite know how to do yet, but it's obvious from calculations that it can be done. If you were to melt it down, melt it, smelt it, bag it, ship it, you would be able to get the entire world's iron and steel production for 10 years. 10 years. The entire world's gold and silver production for 100 years. And the entire world's production of platinum group elements and rare earths for 1,000 years. Why? How? On Earth, these ores were concentrated by water, by mineral processes. You go to the moon, you're not going to be able to get these things because there were no such concentration processes on the moon. With the exception possibly of helium-3 and water at the lunar poles, there's nothing rich really of value there. It's all very dispersed. But a lot of these asteroids came from an early proto-planet that got broken up and what we have access to is what was starting to become the core, the metallic core of this planet. And that's why these things are concentrated. We're talking about vast amounts of wealth. Vast amounts of wealth. And that'll be the topic in part two.